Okay. Welcome, everybody, and to the fifth Sunday of Lent, our presentation on celebrations of the Word of God. And we'll begin today with the greeting and opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. By your help we beseech you, Lord our God, we, may we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So today will be the third of the three scrutinies. The third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent are devoted to what are called the scrutinies. The scrutinies have to do with people who are coming into the church as adult Catholic, people becoming adult Catholics and are preparing for baptism. And so on these weeks preceding Holy Week, which of course begins with Palm Sunday, next Sunday, we have these three sets of scrutiny, special readings. Two weeks ago, it was the woman at the well, where Jesus is the one who overcomes all personal sin. Last week, it was the man born blind, where we see from the reaction of the Pharisees and other issues that Jesus overcomes all societal sin, so the flesh and now the world. And today, we're going to see Jesus's power in the raising of Lazarus from the dead, where he comes over death and he overcomes the power of death itself, which belongs to the devil. So as the uh, catechumens, that is those people preparing for baptism as adults in the Catholic Church, near the Easter Vigil, they go through these scrutinies. So let's begin. The first reading comes from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37. Thus says the Lord God, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and have you rise from them. O my people, I will put my spirit in you that you may live, and I will settle you upon your land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have promised, and I will do it, says the Lord. So, as I mentioned, in this third and final week of the scrutinies, we are shown the power of Christ now even over death itself. This first reading from the prophet Ezekiel was spoken to the exiles, those Jews who had lost everything and been brought to the land of Babylon in exile. And he used the concept of resurrection at this stage in our history of salvation merely as a metaphor for the restoration of the people of Israel. Although Israel seemed, quote, dead by having lost their temple, their king, and even their very land, they will be, quote, resurrected by being returned to the land of Israel, but only after God himself places his, quote, spirit in them. When they witness this great miracle, which in fact would occur within only 70 years of Ezekiel speaking this, and find themselves back in the land of Israel, as the Lord said, then they shall know that I am the Lord. And in addition, they will see his absolute fidelity to them, even when they have been false to him. I have promised and I will do it, says the Lord. The Lord is always there, waiting to show forth his mercy, waiting for us to return, constantly calling to us to come back to him. Although we may be unfaithful, although our hearts may wander, God never so wanders away from us. He never loses his fidelity. And you can always be confident in the mercy and love of God, no matter how far you've drifted. He welcomes you back always and at any time. The second reading now comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit. But only if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. And so whereas in the time of Ezekiel, one of the first uh, times in Scripture we actually had any description of resurrection, it was more metaphorical or it was thought to be metaphorical, 
Now Paul, writing much later in light of the resurrection of Christ, sees one, not only is it metaphorical, but it's literal and true, and that that has real meaning for you and I as believers in Christ. So Paul is teaching us about the reality of resurrection and how it differs from simple resuscitation. We, unlike and like Lazarus, in our resurrection, we won't just be brought back to this same life as we have it here. Our life will be one transformed in ways we can't even begin to understand. So it's infinitely almost different than this life. Although it'll still be me, myself, I'll still have a body, but it's not going to simply be a return to this life that simply doesn't die. Very different. Our physical body already is dead because of sin. This body will age, will decay, will sicken, and eventually will die. There's nothing that can be done about that. But inside of it is the seed of my real life, the true self, deep in my spirit. And that is alive because of righteousness. Not my righteousness, Christ's righteousness. Christ was raised by God through the power of the Spirit because of his righteousness in perfectly loving and perfectly obeying the Father even unto death. And therefore the Father, the one who Paul tells us who raised Jesus from the dead, is the one who is also the power behind our own resurrection. In the sacrament of holy baptism, you and I receive that same Holy Spirit that unites us to Christ as part of his living mystical body. And now through the power of that Spirit that dwells in us even now, as Paul makes clear, we participate in some way in Jesus' own life and existence, even now. Then, thus, we too, just like Jesus our head, will one day experience resurrection as well. As Paul says, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Right? God, through his spirit, just as he raised Jesus, will raise us as well because we're united as sons and daughters to his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. However, Paul warns us that promised life remains a true promise only so long as we remain in communion with Christ as part of his body, the Catholic Church, through our life in the Spirit. You are in the Spirit if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. We gain the Spirit of Christ primarily through our baptism. All Christians have the Spirit living in them and preparing them for their new life in the kingdom, the resurrected life of glory. There are other ways by which a person can be, quote, baptized. The church has spoken of baptism of desire for those who truly wished to enter into the church but were unable to do so for some reason. We have baptism of blood for those who, again, were seeking to enter into the church or at the moment of their lives, gave them up on behalf of Christ willingly and consciously. But in all ways, we have to belong to Christ. We have to live and resemble our Lord, so to speak. If we have that spirit in us, and we do by our baptism, then just like Christ himself, we too will be raised once our physical death has occurred. Those who choose to live under their natural inclinations, however, who follow those disorders are in the quote flesh and remember the flesh does not mean my body although it's true that this this body made of flesh and blood is not which will inherit the kingdom this body is not evil the flesh is anything a mental thought a word an action that is in some way done by my own power not for the glory of God not in connection with the spirit of, of, the, of the living God and so those who are in the flesh, Paul tells us, cannot please God. In fact, to be in the flesh literally is to be opposed to God. It's the life of those in original sin who live under the fallen world and the dominion of the fallen angels. They are opposed to the Lord. Therefore, we need to return to Christ. We need to live according to his spirit. And though dead, and though we will die, we will live and enjoy the eternal divine life in that kingdom forever. So be confident in this. The spirit is not something we necessarily feel. Um, I will talk more on that for those who are interested in connecting with that inter inner spirit. Please look at some of the um, 
the videos that have to do with the life of meditation where I go into that more clearly. But remember, we're meant for something more, something greater, and keep that always in mind as we go through this period towards Easter. Now let's go to the Gospel. A man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained two days in the place where he was. The disciples, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you, and now you want to go back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. He said this, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I am going to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, Master, if he is asleep, you will be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death, while they thought that he meant ordinary sleep. So Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died. And I'm glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go to die with him. So we'll stop there for a moment. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, are all close friends of Jesus. He had become very ill, and so the sisters, in great and expectant faith, sent word to Jesus, telling him, the one you love is ill. Now, strangely, because of his affection for them, we're told that he heard this news, but he remained two days in the place he was. Only after that did he tell the disciples they'd be returning to Judea. The disciples' reaction is one of astonishment because of the animosity so many of the societal elites, the scribes, the Pharisees, soon to be the Sadducees, have against Jesus in Judea. The Lord, however, makes two pronouncements of special importance here. Number one, this illness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Like his teaching on the man born blind, Jesus makes it clear that this um, tragedy is not death and sin, but mercy, power, and salvation for the glory of God. Just as he made clear to, about the man born blind to his apostles that the man was not born blind because of his own sin, nor because of the result of his parents' sin, but he was born blind so that Jesus would have the opportunity to heal and bring God's love and light to him. In the same way, something is going to happen with Lazarus that will glorify the Lord. Um, and notice, he says, not only is it for the glory of God, but through this particular miracle, the Son of God will be glorified. Okay, we already know it's going to happen, but no one had ever raised a man so completely dead as Lazarus. I'll explain what I mean by completely dead in a few moments. Second uh, pronouncement. Are there not 12 hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Here our Lord is now beginning to allude to his own passion when it will be, quote, night out. However, it's nearly upon him that he continues to do the good deeds that God sent him to do in order to continue to bring the light of God, Christ is the light of the world, to people. At this time, some of us might be feeling if we're in darkness, but each of us still has the opportunity to act as Jesus' own light to others, through keeping in touch with them, through encouraging them, praying for them, in whatever way we're able to, serving them. As St. Francis of Assisi taught, start by doing what's required, then do what's possible. Before you know it, you'll be doing the impossible. Jesus must clearly tell the disciples Lazarus has died because they cannot grasp his mystical way of thinking and teaching them about life, quote, saved, death, quote, asleep, and resurrection, quote, awakened. 
Instead, he tells them, I am glad for you that I was not there so that you may believe. Whatever it is, this event should raise the disciples' faith in Christ to an absolute trust and a certainty. The Son of God will be glorified. However, the response of the disciple Thomas sarcastically portends the real later lack of faith they will still have at his own passion. Let us also go to die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles from there. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of him, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, The teacher is here and asking for you. As soon as she heard this, Mary rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with Mary in the house, comforting her, saw her get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming she was going to the tomb to weep there. So upon arriving, Jesus discovers that Lazarus has already been dead for four days. Now in ancient times, that clearly indicated that the life breath of God, the soul, the neshama, had departed Lazarus' body. He was unequivocally and unalterably dead. This differs from example, for example, from that of the, the raising of the dead girl, the raising of um, the young boy, both who, who had been dead only, only for mere hours. It even ex, uh, is beyond that of those miracles by Elisha and Elisha in the Old Testament where a person was raised to life after having only been dead a very short time. Here we have someone who is, quote, his soul has left this world entirely. There's no chance of him being brought back. He's irrevocably dead. Now, when Martha hears Jesus on his way, and Mary would have heard it as well, she immediately goes to see him. But Mary, as we're going to see, kind of wrapped in her grief and anger, stays at home. It's interesting because when we saw Mary and Martha one other time, it was Martha who was sort of portrayed in the bad light in that story, always trying to work while Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened. However, here the roles are reversed, and we see Martha comes out as being clearly the stronger, faithful one in this particular story. Martha meets the Lord. She's also sorrowful, but in deep faith, despite her disappointment at his having been arrived too late to save her brother. She tells him, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Faith. Jesus tells her Lazarus will rise. And like any pious Jew of the first century, she believes in the doctrine of the resurrection, Yes, I know he'll rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus, however, refutes that doctrine. That is, he proclaims to her that the real truth of eternal life is not some teaching or something that will simply automatically happen, but that resurrected life can only come through the life-giving power of Jesus Christ himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. After seeing the depths of Martha's faith in him as the Messiah, Jesus waits on the outskirts of the village while Martha goes to fetch her sister Mary, for he's asked for her. Mary goes immediately, followed by the mourners, thinking she's returning in order to weep and grieve at the tomb. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him then? 
they said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of a blind man have done something so this man would not have died? Unlike Martha, Mary is much more brusque when she encounters the Lord. She's still a believer. She falls at his feet. But she's rather accusingly states, she rather accusingly states, if you'd been here, he would not have died, with no other affirmation of faith beyond that statement. All the grief and sadness finally overwhelmed Jesus. And he, quote, became perturbed and deeply troubled. Strange words. Why? Because Jesus is God. And God is a God of the living. And death is not a reflection of God's love or goodness, but only raises his anger at how the depths to which his creation has fallen. Jesus asks where the tomb is, and there he weeps out of his deep love for a deceased friend. In this, we see the mystery of the unity of the human and divine in Christ, something we simply cannot fathom. But yet, in some way, he cries for us both as God, our creator, who weeps for his creation, but he also cries with us as a human being, our brother in this fallen world, sharing in, this, in the difficulties and trials of life together. Although the crowds present clearly see Jesus' love for Lazarus, like Mary, they are somewhat accusatory, stating, couldn't the man who opened the eyes of a blind man have done something so this man would not have died? So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. She's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial cloths, and his face was wrapped in a, in a cloth. Jesus said to him, them, untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. Jesus now is perturbed again both at the presence of death, but also now at the unbelief of many of those present. And he arrives at Lazarus' tomb, which is a cave with a stone across it. Already, this alludes to Jesus' own passion. He too will be buried in a cave on Golgotha with a stone pushed in front of it. He orders them to take away the stone, and they do so, though doubtful and fearful because of the stench of the decomposing corpse. But Jesus promises, those who believe will see the glory of God. We then have a strange little dialogue where Jesus calls upon God to hear him that the people present may believe in him. What we see going on here is a return to the story of Sinai. At Sinai, God enabled Moses to perform mighty deeds so that the people of Israel, God tells us, might believe both in me and also believe in you as his messenger and servant. God, however, is Jesus, God is Jesus' own father, however, not merely, he is not a servant, but a son. And God always hears and answers him because Jesus is his only begotten son. Even Moses couldn't possibly have brought a corpse back to life. There is something much greater that is occurring here, and those who will witness it know that. Jesus calls for Lazarus to come out, and to the astonishment of all those present, the dead man came out. He was still tied with his burial cloth and wrappings. Again, we see the image of that in Jesus' own resurrection, where he will simply transcend beyond them and they'll be wrapped, neat, wrapped, neatly wrapped up in his own tomb after his resurrection. He orders them to untie Lazarus and we end on a great note of faith. Many of the Jews had come and seen what he had done, began to believe in him. So in summary, we have seen the power of Jesus over the personal sin of the flesh in the story of the Samaritan woman two weeks ago. We've seen the power of Jesus over the social sin and evil of the world in the story of the man born blind last week. And now we see his power even over the deep reality of death itself under the dominion of the devil 
by raising Lazarus. Jesus is the Savior we're prepared to celebrate, and we'll see in his own overconquering of death. And no power in this cosmos can ultimately oppose his infinite might. Each encounter brings us closer and closer to the Lord's own passion, death, and resurrection soon to occur during Holy Week and Easter. Then all will see the truth and know in faith that he is the Lord. And so we end with our rite of spiritual communion. First, we want to pray for the Pope, the hierarchy, the clergy, and all the people of God throughout the world that they may, will maintain steadfast in their faith and remain living examples of Christian love and service, we pray to the Lord. We pray for a quick end to the coronavirus sweeping throughout the world, healing for all those infected by it, peace for those made anxious by it, salvation by any who have died or will die from it. And we ask for a speedy return to the joys of our daily life, we pray to the Lord. We pray for all those gathered together watching this video part of our local church and anyone else who's entered in and joined. We pray for strength, for comfort, for faith, and for purification in this time of trial. We pray to the Lord. Lord, please hear our heartfelt prayers and petitions to you in this time of difficulty. Bless your people and let your presence fill each of us with peace and joy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we'll do a spiritual act of communion. Again, a spiritual act of communion is a special prayer and practice the church has had for a very long time. You can Google it if you want to read it yourself or find one of your own or make one up yourself is fine. But it's when we aren't able to access the sacrament of the Eucharist for some reason, we can at least unite ourselves mind and heart to it. Let's begin. My Jesus, we believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. We love you above all things and we desire to receive you into our souls. Since we cannot at this time receive you sacramentally, we ask you to come spiritually into our hearts. We embrace you as if you were already there, and we unite ourselves wholly to you. Never permit us to be separated from you in any way. Amen. And we end with the closing prayer for the fifth Sunday of Lent. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ in whose body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and have a blessed day.